Yeah, yeah hey, hey, really, and and we we see this curve beginning to flatten, uh, different places, different spaces. Uh, you and I were texting briefly last night, and I I wanted to bring up what I was uh, telling you I was going to ask. You know, one of one of my favorite things about you coming on is we we see the news, we read social media. Everyone's an expert. Everyone's got a degree. Uh, it, it's nice to be able to bring you some of these things to see if you have an explanation. And one of the main things that was in the news mm-hmm. was that uh, Do- Dr. Burks and and other other sources were saying, you know, if somebody passes away um, and they have COVID, that's what they died from. And that turned into, well, hold on a second. Now these numbers are way skewed. It's some conspiracy uh, because now if you had a if uh, if if you had COVID and were hit by a car, you died of COVID, and it just spins out of control. I wanted to ask you, is is that something that you've seen before with other diseases or viruses, uh, and why are they, in your opinion, counting those deaths as deaths from COVID, even if they're attributed to perhaps other things pre-existing they had? So first of all, I want to say is that if you um – tested positive for COVID, and then you died in a car accident, uh, that doesn't mean you're counted as having died from COVID-19. There has to be some reasonable mechanism uh, between the two in terms of the death. It gets a little trickier uh, when someone has COVID, and let's say they have a heart condition, right? That's one of the risks for COVID, and then they die, uh, and you say, well, they would have died from their heart condition, or was it COVID, right? That's, that's, that's a bit more of a gray area. And so what epidemiologists do and public health people do is they do what they call case definitions. And uh, those things actually evolve over time as we learn more about the disease. And so that's a normal standard practice. We, for example, when uh, AIDS was going around and we didn't know it was caused by HIV, you know, the reason it's called syndrome, it's a set of symptoms, so they try to decide, well, what is it that uh, we're trying to measure, right? And, in fact, in this case with uh, COVID, uh, many experts believe we are actually undercounting the number of people, not overcounting, which is what the implication is, is that, well, if you're positive for COVID, no matter how you died, you get counted, right? So the implication there is that we're overcounting, that the number of uh, deaths is overcounted. Actually, um, most evidence is that we're undercounting. And why do we believe we're undercounting? Because after all, it's about testing and so forth. Uh, first of all, the original definition said you had to have a positive test. Well, we have, we're not testing as many people as we could or perhaps should. And so there are people who've died without having a test and have died of conditions very, uh, suspicious of COVID. Uh, so we're talking about people who've died in, uh, who are seniors, who may have died in a, in a nursing home or an institution, who may not have been tested before they died, are in a hospital. Uh, we're talking about people who uh, perhaps, uh, you know, for other, died at home and they, they weren't tested. Uh, for example, one of the things that people talked about, because of the shortage of testing, uh, the coroner or the funeral director uh, the morgue uh, sees a patient who they think died of COVID, but since they didn't have a test uh, and they don't, you want know, to prioritize testing people who are alive, they weren't testing uh, people who were suspicious, so therefore mm. they weren't counted. The other th- piece of evidence is, is what they call excess deaths. So people have charted, so how many people normally die at this time of the year, right? So last year, the year before, and so forth. So what's generally the average and what is the number of deaths we had compared to that average this year with COVID, and we're seeing uh, a, a much larger number of excess deaths, as they call it, uh, than we would uh, normally expect just based on the number of positive tests people are actually counted. So that's another indication that uh, perhaps we're undercounting because the number of people who are dying at this time of the year is much larger than the, quote, average we've had, let's say, in the last five or ten years, plus the number of people who died who accounted for COVID. So what caused all the other people to die? And people suspect those are people who, at least some of them, are people who might have died of COVID who never got a test and therefore aren't counted. Dr. Richard Pan with us here on The Drive on Sports 1140 KHDK. On the testing front, 
Would you say it's more important to have a test to prove whether or not you're positive or to prove whether or not maybe through the antibodies and titers that you've had the virus? What's what's a more important test? Well, they're both uh, equally important in terms of trying to eventually get uh, control over this disease and being able to move to that phase where uh, we can, uh, what we call, identify, contact, trace, and then isolate. So um, the antibody tests, which, by the way, we're still working on, um, technologically, the challenge is, is that, as we talked about before in previous shows, is that we have to be sure we're measuring the antibodies that actually block the infection. So when you get infected with the virus, you create a you may create a lot of antibodies, but you have to be sure you have the ones that keep you from being infected again. So that's the immunity piece. Just because you have antibodies doesn't automatically mean you're immune to the disease. We want to be sure we're measuring the antibodies that would actually prevent uh, a reinfection. And so we're still figuring that out. We're still figuring out to, to what degree people who have recovered are immune to this uh, disease. Um, but we also need to know who's actively infected as well. And so while an antibody test uh, can tell us that, but it's a bit delayed because it takes time for your body to react. If you've never had the disease, it takes, you know, it may take a week or uh, so before you start developing antibodies to it. You could, could have the disease before, and you haven't mounted antibodies to it. So that's what the PCR test, the one they do, the nasal swab, maybe is maybe better at picking up, but then there's some uh, there's been some challenges there as well. So uh, we kind of need both because we need to know who currently has the disease so that they can affect other people, and then we need to hopefully be able to identify people who have already had the disease who are actually immune uh, so that we know that those people aren't as vulnerable. So we actually do need both of them uh, if we're going to effectively gain control over this pandemic and have a better idea about who needs to stay isolated and who can perhaps go out and about their business. State Senator Dr. Richard Penn joins us every Friday at 8.05 to answer your questions. Something else uh, I was looking at this week, Doctor, um, the naval ship that, that mm-hmm. has the COVID cases, and I'll read from the story here. Roughly 60% of the over 600 sailors who tested positive so far on that ship have not shown symptoms of COVID-19, according to the Navy. They did not speculate about how many might later develop symptoms, but according to the, uh, the Surgeon General of the Navy, he says, quote, we're learning that stealth in the form of asymptomatic transmission is this virus's secret power. Now, Doc, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a guy who talks sports. But my goodness, with with the talk about reopening parts of the country, with the talk about resuming some norms, this seems like an incredibly, uh, if not devastating, certainly very difficult thing to take in that you have healthy, in their prime, members of the military, for example, that are carrying this with no symptoms. And all that says to me is, Oh, my goodness. So they can go out and grocery shop and do this and that, not the sailors, but anyone else. And you've got the immunocompromised. You have other people that will have no idea they're standing next to somebody who's a walking Petri dish. dish. Am I overreacting here? Or when you saw that, were you also concerned? Certainly I was very concerned because uh, it makes the job much harder to figure out how to slow the spread spread or stop this disease eventually, right? We're slowing it right now through doing what we're doing now, but uh, eventually to try to stop this disease because uh, that number is larger than we thought it would be. So uh, we've talked in the past how 80% of people who have the disease either have no symptoms or mild symptoms, uh, but we're thinking in terms of the no symptoms that that was probably more around like maybe 25 to 50%. But in this case, and, they, and again, we're learning more about the virus. So, again, we normally test people who are at higher risk uh, or who are in the hospital who already have the symptoms. This is for the first time we're testing a large group of younger people uh, because they're in the military, right? They're, they're generally healthy. And uh, we're finding out that in this pot group, uh, 60% of people don't have symptoms, which 
And that's where we think a lot of people may be catch, you know, catching the disease if you're not working in a hospital or a place where there's a lot of uh, uh, people who are sick, just in the general community, that perhaps this is being spread primarily by people who are asymptomatic who don't know. And uh, that is something that is a very useful piece of information. I'm sure they're going to do some more confirmation. Uh, what, one of the things that the article probably notes is, is that we think that people are infectious probably a few days before they develop symptoms that they're going to develop symptoms. So one of the things I think the article noted is is that we don't know what percentage of that 60% eventually develop symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what percentage were stayed asymptomatic, just never developed symptoms. And that would be useful to know. But still, uh, what that means for all of us is, is that just because you're perfectly healthy and you feel perfectly fine, or the person you're with uh, it feels that way, it doesn't mean they can't be infectious. And uh, so uh, that's why we need a lot more testing. Um, that's also part of that conversation about masks we've had before. Uh, so I said the mask doesn't protect the person who wears it. It does help reduce the spread of the disease from someone who might be infected. And so we often talk about, well, is that how much will that help uh, when it comes to uh, people who don't have symptoms? Although, again, I would just have to always reiterate when we talk about masks is that the masks are the cherry on top. The social distancing, washing your hands, not being in large gatherings still is the most effective way of slowing that spread. So just because you wear a mask doesn't mean you can now hang out with a bunch of other people. Uh, the masks aren't that good. So, uh, yeah, it, it means that this is a tough disease to try to track down, and we probably need to do a lot more testing of people who otherwise are feeling fine uh, to figure this out. So we, we're not quite at that point in terms of the number of tests we have, but that's probably something we have to work our way toward. Dr. Pan, in that example of those sailors, you know, uh, that tested asymptomatic, what's the next step for them? Do they wait the two weeks? Do they, I, obviously, they're, they're confirmed that they're, they're positive, they're asymptomatic. Do, in two weeks, are they retested again? Should they feel good after two weeks if, if nothing further develops? When are they kind of deemed clear? Well, I think what that does involve is having them uh, quarantined until uh, they're, negative and that's by two weeks that's uh, uh and but that's also one of the things we need to learn right so a lot of the studies we've done are looking at people who are already infected who have symptoms and what their course is i guess this is an opportunity for us to learn well we now have a group of asymptomatic uh younger people uh and how long do we have to follow them and how how long does it take for them to be negative and do, and do they stay negative so that's something that would be useful to learn. So the first piece of information we now learned from these sailors, which is the first time we've sort of tested everyone in a very large group of people who are generally younger and healthier, uh, that 60% at least were asymptomatic when they were tested. Now I think they are going to be quarantined and uh, hopefully retested at, to, at some point in time to see if they've, after they've recovered, uh, and see if they're negative at that point in time, so probably 14 days, but hopefully we're going to learn a little more about uh, the quarantine time and how infectious they are at the end of that period, and are, should that be a good time for them to be able to go free. The question, I think, the, the, the million-dollar question, heck, the trillion-dollar question here is, mm -hmm. and, and what stays in the back of my mind, Doc, is you have so much experience with all of this. Um, the question seems to be, are, do you develop immunity if you had it? If so, how long does that immunity go? If we have a combination where, well, let, me, let me just ask it straight up. Okay. Is there a legit possibility in your mind that there may not be immunity if you had it? And, and, and what I mean by that is very temporary, a couple of weeks, a month or two. Could this conceivably be a virus that you can get over and over and over again, like the common cold, or have you, you know, ruled that out or come close to it? Unfortunately, we have not ruled that out. And if people, if most people don't develop some form of longish-term immunity, uh, so at least a few years, 
it's going to be very challenging to figure out how we're going to deal with this virus, right? So if, uh, you know, people may have different reactions uh, as people are checking antibody tests uh, for people who have gotten the disease. Uh, there's been some mixed results about exactly uh, how much antibody they produce. Uh, or is it the right kind? We're still figuring that out. Uh, this virus is fairly stable in terms of changes, so that brings some hope that when you get infected and you uh, respond to that, that hopefully that means that whatever immunity you develop will last for a while because usually if the virus changes quickly, uh, that makes it harder for your immune system to keep up, right? So the immune system sees the virus as like a wanted picture, and if that picture doesn't change very much, then it will respond the next time it sees it. If the virus changes, like wearing lots of disguises, then it's less likely the immune system notices that that's that virus. So the fact that it doesn't change is a good sign, but we still don't know yet. We're still trying to figure that out. And you're right, if it turns out that a large proportion of people, when they get the disease, uh, only develop very short-term immunity, that's going to make a huge challenge to figure out how we're going to manage this virus. Dr. Richard Pan with us here on The Drive. we got a text coming in here from Alex in Okra, wants to know if he should uh, cancel his wedding in October. Wow. Um, well, October is a bit out there, uh, so I'm not sure specifically the wedding plans. Uh, probably, I mean, if it's a huge gathering where you know you're bringing in a you know, 500 of your best friends uh, to a large hall, you might want to downsize. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be at that point in October, but again, it's October, so it's a long ways out. Uh, probably wouldn't cancel yet, but I'm sure that you and all your guests probably thinking that's a possibility. Uh, so let's see what happens uh, over the next several months, what we learn. We're learning new things about this virus uh, you know, every week. So, for example, as you mentioned, the story about the sailors, right? That's telling us something about it. Sometimes the news is better than other times, but we are learning more, and that gives us a better idea of how to get a hold of that. this. And so, you know, there is uh, always a possibility uh, and in October that uh, might be able to do uh, something uh, that may still allow an event like a uh, reasonably sized wedding to be able to go forward. Uh, but again, that's speculation at this point because we, I just don't know. Uh, but October, let's give a, give a little time to see what we, uh, where we get to in the summer. Uh, and, uh, uh, but now if it's a destination wedding where a lot of people are flying, uh, that might be a little more challenging too. Last thing for you, Dr. Pan, much like uh, hydrochloroquine, people are going to start becoming very familiar, I would imagine, over the next few days uh, with the company Gilead and Remdesivir. And they, mm -hmm. they made news over the last 24 hours uh, by filing a patent uh, for a bottle that would carry a coronavirus, we don't know, treatment, cure, whatever. I can't expect you to know everything everywhere. Uh, you're a genius, but I, I get that sometimes there may be limitations, but i got to ask you, are, are you at all familiar uh, with remdesivir? And for people out there just looking for hope, is this when they see things like this, should they become hopeful, or would you advise take everything with a large, large grain of salt? Well, uh, certainly I want people to be hopeful, right? Um, so we, we should try to be hopeful about uh, things. At the same time, uh, in the end, we have to recognize that uh, we need science to sort out claims from actual facts. So there's things we don't know, right? And so treatments, uh, there's a lot of, until we do the studies, we don't know for sure whether it's going to help or not. So uh, the uh, this medication from Gilead uh, uh, seems to be promising in terms of helping out people uh, who receive the treatment uh, who are sick, I believe. Um, I have to go back and look at the actual study again. But there's still more work to be done, and uh, people are looking at a variety of different uh, therapies to see what could be helpful. So the question is, is that um, we have therapies that might be able to help people who are already intubated uh, be more likely to uh, not die or get off the ventilator earlier, so that will be useful for people already in the hospital. Uh, are there other treatments that might help people from 
being um, intubated and requiring a ventilator in the first place. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so we need to do these studies. And when you asked me before about treatments, I basically said, you know, we certainly want people to have hope. Uh, and how we're going to figure out most quickly is, is that uh, to have people, if they can, uh, and they qualify to enter these trials. And I know it seems kind of scary because it's like, well, I don't want people experimenting on me or my loved one. It's, but without an actual treatment, we're not, I mean, we're experimenting in the sense that it's not because we, do, we have something that would work and we don't want to give it to you or your loved one. It's that we don't know what works. And the fastest way for us to figure out what works is to have people enter trials so we can most quickly get to the point where we can say, well, this either works or it doesn't work and, uh, in terms of helping people. And so that's what we need to do and uh, to, to try to figure this out. Well, you know, this segment always flies by, quickest segment of the week. Mm-hmm. We're out of time, but real quick, I want to I want to promote this. Uh, Dr. Pan has started a podcast called Putting the Public into Health. Uh, he's had Angie Ashby. That's the episode uh, I'm looking at right now, our, our dear friend who's on the city council. And as you know, listening to Dr. Pan, uh, I, I don't know of a better source, so I, I highly recommend uh, you search that out online. You can also follow Dr. Pan at Dr. Dr. Pan MD. I'll go ahead and retweet right now the link to his podcast. Dr. Pan, uh, we love you and we appreciate uh, your voice. It's very soothing and educational for so many. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. No, thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you.